May 10th, 1869, 12.47 p.m., Promontory Summit, Utah. At this place, on this day, at this time, the United States of America became truly united. Travel time from the east to the west was cut from months to weeks. For the first time in the nation's history, a railroad stretching across the continent was open, safely and reliably connecting people from one side of the country to the other. The force of this event changed the United States forever. The force that powered this nation a century and a half ago still pushes the nation forward today. On this day, the nation is celebrating the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. So let's take a step back and look at a great fleet undertold event that built the United States into the nation it is today. After America's first steam locomotive made its debut, railroads began to connect cities in the east, with 9,000 miles of track constructed by 1850. During this time period, Americans began migrating to the promising west coast, a trend which increased rapidly after the discovery of gold in California. However, the journey by foot was long, risky, difficult, and expensive taking travelers through steep mountain ranges and bad weather. Many opted to take the six-month route by sea around Cape Horn at the tip of South America. In addition, a trip across the continent cost nearly a thousand dollars at the time. Seeing this, New York entrepreneur Asa Whitney presented a resolution to Congress in 1845, proposing a railroad that would stretch to the Pacific coast. Because of sectionalism in Congress, lobbying efforts failed time and time again over the next several years, but the idea still had great potential. In 1860, engineer Theodore Judah pointed out that the infamous Donner Pass would be an ideal area to build a railroad through the Sierra Nevadas. The following year, Judah organized a group of Sacramento investors to charter the Central Pacific Railroad Company. He then headed to the nation's capital where he successfully convinced Congress, as well as President Abraham Lincoln, of the idea of building a railroad to the west. Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Act into law in 1862. The Central Pacific would start building in Sacramento, pushing eastward, and the Union Pacific would start building in Omaha, Nebraska, pushing westward. The two lines would meet somewhere in the middle, but at the time, a meeting point was not determined. Each company would receive $48,000 in bonds per mile of track and 64,000 acres of land. This amount was later doubled to 12800 From this point forward, the great race was underway. The Central Pacific was dominated by the Big Four, as they were called. Leland Sanford, Charles Crocker, Mark Hopkins, and Collis Huntington. Although they had no prior railroad experience, all of them were determined businessmen. They borrowed heavily and exploited legal loopholes to get maximum funding for their project. The Central Pacific broke ground in January 1863. Indifferent with the investors, however, Theodore Judah planned to recruit new investors, but these plans came to an end when he contracted yellow fever while crossing the Isthmus of Panama and died that November. Meanwhile in Omaha, Thomas Durant illegally achieved controlling interests of the Union Pacific, which gave him authority over the project. He would also illegally set up a company that would give him all of the profit. Little would be completed on the Union Pacific side until the end of the Civil War in 1865. The Union Pacific finally began their push westward in May of 1866, after Union Army hero Grenville Dodge 
took control as chief engineer. The Union Pacific soon found that the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad would be anything but ordinary. The company suffered attacks from Native American tribes of the Sioux, Arapaho, and Cheyenne. Understandably upset and threatened by the progress of the iron horse across their land. Despite this, the Union Pacific continued their trek westward at a rather fast pace compared to their rival company out of Sacramento. After struggling to obtain workers, Charles Crocker of the Central Pacific began hiring Chinese laborers in 1865. Some 50,000 Chinese immigrants resided on the west coast and 14,000 of them proved to be tireless workers on the railroad by 1867. In sharp contrast to this, the workforce on the Union Pacific was mainly made up of Irish immigrants and Civil War veterans. By summer of 1867, the Union Pacific had reached Wyoming, covering four times as much ground as the Central Pacific. In late June, however, the Central Pacific broke through the mountains and the hard part was finally behind them. Both companies began heading towards Salt Lake City, cutting many corners to get ahead in their race. By early 1869, the two were mere miles away from each other, but newly inaugurated President Ulysses S. Grant held funding for the project until the two companies decided on a meeting point. In the end, they decided to meet at Promontory Summit just north of the Great Salt Lake. The Central Pacific arrived on May 8th 1869, with the Union Pacific following two days later. The last rails were laid. The railroad was finally near completion, but there was one more task that had yet to be done. Almost done. Yeah. To the to the. 
country. D O M E John. Pacific Railroad of the United States of America. Yeah. <laughs> Bulletin. Uh, promontory to the President of the U.S. Simpson Grant, Washington, D.C. The Associated Press, East and West. Final Bulletin. Promontory Summit. Utah Territory, May 10th, 1869, 12.50 p.m. Mr. President, the last rail was laid, the last bike is driven. The Pacific Railroad is completed to a junction 1,086 miles west of the Missouri River, 690 miles east of Sacramento City. Signed, Leland Stanford, President of the Central Pacific Railroad, Thomas Duran, Sidney Dillon, John Duck, Union Pacific Railroad. All right, everyone. Let's give three cheers for the Union Pacific Railroad. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give three cheers for the Central Pacific. <laughs> Nothing is more vital than transportation. For only that nation possessing efficient mass transport facilities could hope to survive the ordeal of modern conflict. Fortunate are we to be a nation whose economy has ever been geared to the steel rail and the driving locomotive. For this, as never before, is a war of movement. Today, unquestionably, the American railroads are the very backbone of the nation's transportation system. Following the driving of the last spike, the American economy boomed. For the next eight decades, the mass transport backbone of the nation was undoubtedly the railroads. They had led America through two world wars, a Great Depression, and a host of ups and downs. And like all industries, they evolved and changed with the times. By the time the 1880s rolled around, the railroads of America began to face a problem. As traffic grew, the railroads needed more power to haul the increased loads. For a long time, the answer to this problem was simply to double-head locomotives, but this solution meant that the railroads had to invest in extra engines, each one just as expensive as the last. It was certainly a thrill to see, but it was at the expense of the railroads that drove the nation. The answer to this problem was also simple, add more driving wheels. So over time, four wheels grew to six, six wheels grew to eight, eight wheels grew to 10, and in one extreme case, 10 wheels grew to 12. It seemed like a good fix, but this solution created yet another problem. The more driving wheels added, the larger the cylinders and boiler had to be to create enough steam to drive them. As locomotives grew larger and longer, they began to have trouble tackling curves, bridges, and tunnels designed for smaller engines. The same problem had been plaguing European railroads, so Swiss engineer Anatole Mallet designed a new type of steam locomotive as a solution. This new design featured two sets of driving wheels, each with its own pair of cylinders. 
the two sets were joined by a large hinge pin, with the front set able to articulate freely of the rest of the locomotive. This allowed locomotives to take tighter turns with ease. This design was the most widespread solution to the power and size issue, used by railroads around the world, and with many revisions made on the design. One widely spread version had used steam in the back set of cylinders at a high pressure, and was used again at a lower pressure in the front set. This revision was named after the man who had designed it, the Mallet. The first Mallet type used in America was the Baltimore and Ohio's 1904 built 0660 number 2400, often nicknamed Old Mott. The Erie and Virginian railroads took the Mallet design a step further by creating a locomotive with three sets of drivers, often nicknamed triplexes. While the triplex design was not successful, the Mallet design was overall well received by railroads. But by the turn of the 20th century, the railroads began to face another mounting problem, a continued increase in traffic with limited steam technology to innovate. This time, the locomotives could certainly handle the jobs given to them, but it was unlikely that they could do them quickly and efficiently. Until the 20s, the focus was on tractive effort, but not horsepower. Following a series of experiments, Ohio's Lima Locomotive Works had developed a new locomotive with the larger firebox, with an extra wheel added to the trailing truck for support, creating an entirely new wheel arrangement, a 284. The increased firebox size allowed for more coal combustion and heat output, producing more steam and generating more power. These improvements and others created the concept for horsepower at speed, or as the Lima Works called it, superpower. This new superpower design was tested against the common Mikado in the Berkshire Mountains of the Boston and Albany. The 284 design was quickly proven superior and was quickly adopted by several railroads. This locomotive design was also later named after the mountains over which they were first proven, the Berkshires. Several other wheel arrangements emerged from the Berkshire design, including the 484 Northern, the 464 Hudson, and the 2104 Texas. The articulated design and the superpower design eventually combined to form what many believe was the pinnacle of steam locomotive technology. These included the Norfolk and Western's 2664 Class A's and 2882 Y6B's, and the Union Pacific's 4664 Challengers and 4884 Big Boys. The period during World War II was undoubtedly a high point for the railroad industry with the new superpower design in full swing across the nation, and with wartime freight almost entirely being moved by rail, freight traffic was booming, and the economic importance of the American railroads could not be underestimated. Following World War II, the railroads entered into a state of change. The steam locomotive's days were numbered, and as diesel technology was developing, the train of tomorrow was quickly becoming a reality. It was after the 40s, that the unthinkable happened. The railroad industry began facing an irreversible decline, while the rest of the country was enjoying a post-war economic success. The golden age of railroading was coming to an end. Fast forward to a century after the driving of the Golden Spike to 1969, and most railroads were facing an all-time low. The industry as a whole was going through the biggest change it had ever faced. The beloved steam locomotive had nearly vanished from the scene. Airlines and interstate highways had stolen potential passengers and freight shippers, and railroads were merging multiple times, each with hopes of creating a better railroad for tomorrow. However, almost every merger at that time led to a failing line that was losing more money than it was gaining. But despite these hardships, the industry struggled on. 12.01 a.m., February 1st, 1968. The prime example of this problem was the product of a merger between the New York Central and Pennsylvania Railroads.
Penn Central. The railroad was incorporated in 1968, and just two short years later, it was in bankruptcy. During a single recent month, Penn Central suffered 649 derailments, ranging from a single car or locomotive to pileups of 10, 15, or more. They damaged 252 locomotives and 1,637 freight cars. They caused cargo damage of more than $400,000. No railroad, let alone Penn Central, can afford such losses. Penn Central has about 150,000 freight cars. Nearly 13% of them are out of service. Because it cannot supply enough cars to meet the demands of shippers, Penn Central is losing more than $150,000 in freight revenue each day. That's nearly $70 million a year of lost revenue. Well, if I had to live my life over again, I'd never work for a railroad. It was certainly a far cry from 100 years prior, a promise of a successful transcontinental railroad. The railroad industry had become a mere shell of its former self. It had seemed like the world had almost forgotten about May 10, 1869, but little did they know, someone was working to change that. Believing that the event of May 10th, 1869 was one of the great undertold stories of American history, then New York commodities broker Ross E. Rowland Jr. had the brilliant idea to run a grand excursion from New York to Utah and back, stopping each night in a prearranged town to display the train to the public. Needless to say, his beautiful blue and gold excursion train, named the Golden Spike Centennial Limited, was a huge success in promoting this historic event and did so in grand style. The Limited was powered almost entirely by steam, traveling through towns that had not seen an active steam locomotive in decades. Featured motive power for the journey was X Nickel Plate Road 284 number 759, dressed up in the bunting of the Association of American Railroads to complement the train. Also featured as motive power were Union Pacific 484 number 8444, X Pennsylvania Railroad GG1 Electric, number 4902, also dressed up for the occasion, and Union Pacific Centennial Diesel, number 6900. The Limited carried over 100 passengers, including actor John Wayne, who rode the final leg of the trip into Salt Lake City. Wayne suggested to Roland that, because America's 200th birthday was then seven years away, he should put a train together like the Limited to celebrate. Roland pledged to begin work on that project, and thus was born the even more successful American Freedom Train. So I thought it was a, a, the 100th anniversary of that great event was something worth bringing to the public's attention. And I went to the Association of American Railroads and said, look, we've got a first class mainline steam engine now, the Nickel Plate 759. We've proven ourselves organizationally that we can do these things. You put your name on it with us. We'll do all the grunt work. We'll put the train together. We'll do the schedule in cooperation with the railroads. Uh, you get behind it as a sponsor and tell the railroads to cooperate. And we'll operate a New York to Utah and back excursion. And we'll stop each night in a different town, uh, prearranged, and have three baggage cars. And in those baggage cars, we'll tell the past, present, and future story of American railroading with your help. Uh, and they said, good, let's do that. So we did that. But we're always on our way, we're on our way. But we're always on our way, we're on our way. But we're always on our way, we're on our way. Hey, 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 hey. But we're always on our way, we're on our way. But we're
Lucky the boy who one day could say he had seen them in action. For by 1960, the age of steam had virtually ended, and the thrill of seeing a mammoth engine at work was to be only a happy memory of childhood. Fast forward to today, May 10th, 2019, 150 years following the driving of the last spike, and the railroad industry is back on its feet again. At the start of 1974, President Richard Nixon signed the Regional Rail Reorganization Act, or 3R Act for short, into law. This provided funding for failing railroads to continue operations temporarily, while proposing the solution the Consolidated Rail Corporation, or Conrail. This act also incorporated the United States Railway Administration to take over the powers of the Interstate Commerce Commission for the merger. The USRA was to create a final system plan for the consolidation, but unlike most railroad consolidations, only designated lines of the railroads were to be taken over. Other lines would be sold to Amtrak or other railroads and agencies. This plan was unveiled on July 26, 1975. Bankrupt lines of the Penn Central and Erie Lackawanna, Anthracite roads of the Lehigh Valley and Reading Company, Michigan's Ann Arbor Railroad, as well as many others would all be folded into the new Consolidated Rail Corporation. This plan was approved by Congress that November and signed into law by President Gerald Ford the following February. The railroad officially began operations on April 1st 1976. In its early years, Conrail was still highly unprofitable, continuing to lose thousands each day. By the time the 1980s rolled around, the railroad reported a net operating loss of $2.2 billion. This was the case until 1980, when Congress passed the Staggers Rail Act, which significantly deregulated America's railroads. Following this act, and the aggressive leadership of L. Stanley Crane, Conrail finally began turning a profit, reporting taxable income of between $2 million to $314 million. While Conrail has since been merged between Norfolk Southern and CSX, the railroad industry is now almost just as successful as it was during World War II, with continued modernization being made to make rail travel and transport safer and more efficient. But the real celebration today isn't in the major railroad towns of the East, such as Bellevue, Vastoria, Altoona, or Fort Wayne, but instead across the country at the very place where history was made 150 years ago today, Promontory Summit, Utah. Today is the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. The Golden Spike National Historic Site has a rebuilt section of the original track through Promontory, with working replicas of the famous locomotives used in the original ceremony, Central Pacific No. 60 Jupiter and Union Pacific No. 119. 
the Union Pacific Railroad, which has since taken over the Central Pacific, is also taking part in today's festivities in the neighboring city of Ogden. Their world-famous steam locomotive number 844 is operating today in this historic city, in front of the old Ogden Union Station. But even more exciting is this. A Union Pacific Big Boy locomotive is under steam once again, for the first time in 60 years. Following an incredibly major rebuild by the talented steam crew at Union Pacific, and a huge rush to completion before the celebration, Big Boy Locomotive Number 4014 has made the trek from the shops in Cheyenne to Ogden and is now nose to nose with Locomotive Number 844, recreating the famous photo from May 10th, 1869. It's certainly quite a sight to see in an age where a steam locomotive on the main line is nearly a thing of the past. The fact that railroading has survived through such a low as it had during the Penn Central days shows not only the tenacity of the industry itself, but also of the people who work for it. The industry has withstood bleaker times before and now marches into the future stronger and wiser. The fact that an industry that kick-started westward expansion 150 years ago still moves people and goods from coast to coast today speaks volumes to just how important railroading is to our country. The story of American railroading has been long and winding, and has sometimes barely even made sense, but it's certainly far from it. Oh, <laughs> oh,